All right, thank you everyone for joining us. I'll go ahead and get started. Welcome to today's webinar, The Importance of Academia's Role in Advancing Conservation and Biodiversity to Address Climate Change and Human Health. Um, today, we have Marianne Jorgensen and David Foster joining us. Um, and I'll just share a little bit about our speakers before turning it over to them. Um, so Marianne currently serves as the Program Manager for Academics for Land Protection in New England for Alpine. Alpine is a network of colleges and universities in New England that is coordinated by the Lincoln Institute of Land Policy with funding from the Highstead Foundation. Um, Alpine members seek to advance the importance of land conservation from urban centers to rural communities and associated agricultural and forest lands. David is a faculty member in the Organismic and Evolutionary Biology Department at Harvard University. He's also the director of the Harvard Forest and president of the Highstead Foundation, a regional conservation nonprofit based in Reading, Connecticut, which is dedicated to increasing the pace of land, con of land protection in New England and beyond. Dr. Foster and uh, his fellow faculty colleagues from 15 other institutions also developed wildlife, wild lands and woodlands, a vision for the New England landscape in 2010 that has become an initiative of partners who value land conservation as an essential tool for improving the health and well being of nature and society. So, again, I wanted to extend a huge welcome to our speakers today. I'm very much looking forward uh, to learning from them. Uh, a bit of housekeeping, we do have a question and, an and answer session after um, our speakers present. If you at any time want to add your questions into the Q&A box down at the bottom, feel free, and then we will um, bring those up towards the end. Um, so that's it for me. I'll go ahead and uh, turn it over to our speakers to present and let me spotlight them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Chantel. Hi, everyone. And thanks for joining us today. David and I are thrilled to be here and thank Second Nature for giving us this opportunity to talk with you about the role of academia advancing conservation and biodiversity to address planetary and human health. As said, my name is Marianne Jorgensen. I work as the manager for a network called Academics for Land Protection in New England or Alpine. This presentation will discuss the importance of academia advancing biodiversity and land conservation together with other sustainability goals. We call for colleges and universities to extend their work beyond campus sustainability to embrace the urgent call for transformative action in supporting climate, biodiversity, and human well being as they are critically linked and need to be addressed simultaneously. David, take it away. Okay, Marianne, thank you very much. Just share my screen and get started. With no question, it's quite apparent that we have a climate crisis. As shown by this article published in Bioscience, Academics have played a leading role in both highlighting and pushing governments and industry to fight this crisis. But it's very clear, even from the headline and the graphics in this article, that this crisis is much bigger than climate alone and that many factors beyond greenhouse gases are contributing to it. Deforestation, farming practices, population growth, and development are all contributing, and as a consequence, nature is declining, and many species are declining, and some are going extinct. Now this fall, there were actually two important global conferences, two COP or COP meetings. The recent one that dealt with climate change and an earlier one, a month before, on biodiversity. 
When the two intergovernmental groups that led these meetings issued a joint report back in June, which is this figure on the left, they came to the conclusion that actually there are three crises facing the globe. And they face not only the globe, but all countries and most communities in the world. And these are the crises of climate change, of biodiversity, or the loss of nature on land and in our waters and in our seas, and the crisis of human equity and well being. Now, critically, the loss of nature, that is, the destruction and mismanagement of natural ecosystems, is both a crisis unto itself, but also a crisis that helps to drive the climate crisis and exacerbate the crisis for people. It is this focus on protecting nature by conserving it and managing it well that we want to link to climate change and address today. One reason to do so is because this crisis has led to recent, to two recent but historic pronouncements this past year. At COP26, as shown at the top, most of the countries agreed to end deforestation. But back in January, Joe Biden made an earlier announcement on what is called 30 by 30. In doing so, the president made a US commitment in line with international commitments that have already been made by many other countries. And that is to protect 30% of US land and ocean areas by 2030. Behind both of these commitments is the understanding that nature, forests, wetlands, grasslands, waters, and our seas represent essential natural infrastructure for human life. Forests and other ecosystems offer what has come to be called natural solutions. Natural solutions that mitigate climate change, that retain our valuable species, that provide all of us with clean water, clean air, and moderate, moderate environments to live in. Importantly, nature is absolutely critical in the fight against climate change as it both helps to mitigate climate change by storing carbon on land and in the seas, and it helps us be resilient to the manifestations of climate change. Extreme heat, extreme weather, flooding, and other impacts. Based on all of this, we're here to argue the following. Colleges and universities have the moral obligation to address the major crises facing humanity. Now already, Second Nature, AISHE, and the administration, staff, faculty, and students at many colleges and universities have done a huge job in addressing climate change and sustainability on and beyond their campuses. These actions have already made a big difference and have wielded great influence. But it is now time to do more, to expand these efforts, to embrace the way that we treat our land and our water with an interest in sustaining all life and improving human well being on and off of campus. Now, fortunately, the framework for the work that we propose and want to talk about today is already well established through the existing frameworks and strategic plans that Second Nature and others have developed to address climate change, which is shown in brief on this slide. Colleges and universities have the ability to influence, have great influence over the way that society treats the environment at many scales on our campuses, in our local communities, across many regions and states, the regions and states that we all reside in, call our home and identify with, and nationally and globally. These actions are taken through research, through education, 
through college operations, through purchasing, through the application of knowledge and financial resources to planning and policymaking in local, state, federal, and international arenas. They're also taken through the investment of university resources, including their endowments, and through the ongoing actions of members of the college community when they graduate or when they retire and continue to actively participate in society. Now, let me switch gears and move from exhortation about what should and could or might happen and switch briefly to personal storytelling and convey the way that I and many academics in New England became convinced of the need for this type of action that we're talking about and its potential to have a great influence. Now, the story that I'm going to convey and the examples that we're both going to give are emblematic only of a few directions that the academic commitment that we're talking about might take. There are many, many other ways to operate, many other modes of, oper of action that can be taken by each person who is listening to this talk and to each person who participates in an academic community. So the personal story. As scientists working and teaching at the Harvard Forest, which is a 4,000 acre institute that's been owned and managed by Harvard University since 1907, our research increasingly revealed that across the New England landscape, that direct human activity was destroying approximately 24,000 acres of forest land, as well as additional farmland every year. Through the development for housing, through commercial activity, for new and so-called green solar development, as well as countless other acres of land that are being damaged by poor forestry and poor farming practices. At the same time, we recognized that the New England region is one of the most heavily forested areas in the United States, and that these forests provide critical infrastructure for the survival and enjoyment of every resident, as well as playing a huge part in local and regional economies. Now, just stop to think of the tourism, the recreation, the wood products, and even the maple syrup that all comes from this landscape. Think also of the value of the history, appearance, and environmental quality of that landscape to the 200 plus colleges and universities that reside here. So let me provide two quick examples of how large the benefits from nature are to this region. The forests of New England are actively taking up 20% or so of the CO2 that is generated by this region. Every acre that we deforest reduces that potential forever and gives off in the process additional CO2. Every acre that we manage poorly also reduces the capacity of that forest to mitigate climate change during the time when we need it most. Secondly, the largest city in the region, Boston, gets all of its drinking water from a, from a nearly fully forested and fully protected watershed. That water goes directly into residences as some of the cleanest water in the country with no major treatment. 40% of the state's population gets its water cleaned by nature through this one source. It gets it for free or free in terms of treatment because the state wisely decided in the 1900s, the early 1900s through the recent time to buy a portion of the watershed and then to begin to work with private landowners to conserve it, to conserve private land throughout the watershed. Now looking to the map on the right, 
at the same time that we recognize the value of nature, we also recognize that although heroic efforts had been made at land conservation, that if what is represented as conserved in this map or colored in this map was all the forest and farmland that we had in the future, that it would be completely inadequate to provide all of these benefits. Given all this, we decided to take action and to publish a different kind of paper, a paper that didn't just seek academic accolades, but one that sought to stimulate recognition of a problem and action. So in 2010, we gathered together authors from across Harvard, the Harvard Forest, a dozen other colleges and universities, and most of the states in the region. And we wrote a vision for the future that would develop of all the public agencies and conservations, as well as many private landowners, would act to increase the pace of land protection, to conserve the region's forests and all the benefits that this would provide. As we began to develop a series of programs to advance this effort in response to a strongly supportive reading and encouragement by conservation organizations and state agencies, we sought to bring concert, more conservation groups together and to get more academics involved. While we were doing that, a few of our group members participated with a separate institution and separate organization called Food Solutions New England, which is based out of the University of New Hampshire, and which chose to author a New England food vision in 2014. This was a conservation and food vision to provide healthy, local, and regionally developed food for all of New England that worked within the conservation framework of our forest vision, wildlands and woodlands. By 2017, we had brought together a vision for smart development, farmland conservation and forest conservation that covered the entire New England region in a collaboration that we call wildlands, woodlands, farmlands and communities. Now this graph in a very simple way captures the vision that we've laid out. On the left, you see in two different shades of green and then, and then gray forest areas, and then farmland, and then developed land, and at the very top water. Moving across the bottom to 2019, 2010, when this vision was initiated or laid out, you can see that what we advocate for is a great, but actually historically plausible increase in the pace of conservation that would result in 70% of the region occupied by conserved forest and 7% in conserved farmland. These lands would be owned by the same kinds of diverse groups and hopefully additional groups that own the land today. Private families, individuals, nonprofit organizations, including many conservation groups, state agencies, federal agencies, tribal groups, and local communities. Now, one of the first things we did when we began this work was to seek out a regional funder who could partner with us and to help advance what, advance partnerships broadly among conservation entities, recognizing that there's an extraordinary number of land trusts, larger organizations, including state and national scale and even international organizations like the Nature Conservancy that work within this region. But there's also municipalities, state agencies and federal agencies that are also advancing conservation. And so we, we sought to match up at a kind of sub-regional scale, the different interests of these different groups with local residents and other groups to develop what we called regional conservation partnerships. 
that would increase the strength and activity of any single group by sharing information, sharing fundraising, and coordinating their activities. We also tried to pair these up with local colleges and regional universities, and with some staffing to coordinate and to help advance some of the, the partnerships throughout this region and with involvement from many colleges and universities, a total of 51 of these regional conservation partnerships have developed and are now advancing conservation across 60% of New England. Now these groups vary. Some of them are older and extraordinarily active and successful. Some are fledgling groups that are just trying to get started but they all have a commitment to work within their own area to advance the pace of land protection for the benefit of all. So in the 11 years that we've been actively operating, the Wildlands, Woodlands and Farmlands and Communities Initiative has grown to include many major programs, most of which also include significant academic partners and leadership. These include a great number of scientists from social, physical, and biological sciences from many colleges and universities, the regional conservation partnerships that I just mentioned, a regional policy network that includes active participation by the University of New Hampshire, Food Solutions, and other groups, the Food Solutions Group itself, which is based at the University of New Hampshire, a group led out of Yale that specializes in financing of land conservation, and a new group that we call Alpine, Academics for Land Protection in New England, which is based out of the Lincoln Institute for Land Policy and the University of Massachusetts. This group recognizes the power of academic institutions to affect change and brings together more than 100 schools across the region. And with that, I'll turn the talk over to Marianne. Thanks, David. As David explained, the idea for Alpine came out of this report written by about 30 scholars from institutions across New England that outlined this vision for forests in New England and called for an unparalleled long-term conservation effort this scale of conservation, according to the authors, will retain and enhance the many benefits that forests provide, including clean air and water, recreation, and a variety of forest products. They concluded that it will take an initiative from all sectors, in innovators from the public, private, civic, and academic sector to address the immense environmental challenges we face, including climate change and biodiversity. Academic institutions in New England, where much of the theory and practice of conservation and environmental protection emerged in the US historically, has a great deal to offer in addressing these challenges. To tap the energy and initiative of the colleges, universities, research stations, and other organizations across the region, the Wildlands and Woodlands Initiative were inspired to create Alpine. The organization's mission is to encourage the faculty, students, administration, staff, and alumni of institutions of higher education across New England to become significantly engaged in the conservation of the land across the region as one of the many tools that's needed for the health of the climate and nature. There are many institutions working very hard to advance land conservation on their campuses through teaching, research, working with land trusts, conserving land, and engaging students. And it would be beneficial to learn from each other and share those resources to make a larger impact. We started the network about five years ago in New England, in the New England states, because we felt that it was important to start at a smaller scale. The aim was to get the network active and successful regionally and then expand it nationally. The choice to start New England has the advantage that New England has a large number of colleges and universities that are diverse in size and focus both large public institutions as well as many private small colleges. Many schools own a large amount of land in this area. And although it's a small in area, New England small in area in relation to the rest of the US, the reach of the network is large with significant numbers of students, faculty and alumni. 
I'll describe in more detail what we're doing at Alpine, realizing that Alpine is just one of the many ways that universities and colleges can engage in land protection and biodiversity. Next slide, David. There's so much happening at individual schools, but we realized that each was not aware of what other schools were doing. And even within an institution, as you probably all know, you know, many times individuals don't know what others are doing at that particular school. So we thought that by learning from each other, highlighting best practices, sharing research curriculum, project ideas, this could inspire others to get more involved with land conservation. And we began to develop strategies and goals for the four constituents in academia, realizing that each group would have, a, would have different goals. So just briefly, um, students, the focus that we have or the goals that we have for students is to educate and train them to increase awareness and the importance of land protection, to increase active participation by students in land protection through projects and research and internships, and to develop future leaders and career paths in the field. For faculty, the goals are to increase their knowledge and their teaching of land conservation, to increase collaborations between faculty and land conservation organizations, to focus research efforts on land conservation and to develop advocates. And with the administration, it was to engage with them, the awareness of why of the importance of land conservation to the institution and the community that they're a part of for the, all these benefits we're talking about for not only the university, but for their region. That includes climate change, clean water, carbon neutrality, and the health of their students. I think then, and realizing that colleges and university institutions are realizing that um, students are now these issues are important to their students and, choose, and students are choosing colleges based on what they're doing with their sustainability goals. And then incorporate land protection and stewardship into the mission of the institution and advance land conservation efforts in their communities and regions to create more resilient regions and make communities more equitable and inclusive and pursuing critical goals like 30 by 30 by engaging and helping resource more local groups outside of the conservation sector. And then lastly, uh, one of the other goals we have is to engage students and faculty, staff, administrators, and alumni in activities of land trusts and other regional conservation organizations. Alpine is a partner with the Regional Conservation Partnerships, which came out of the Wildlands and Woodlands vision. Their collaborations between existing land trusts and these other partners municipal, state, federal agencies, academic institutions, and conservation organizations. And they are promoting long-term collaborations, realizing that it can be more effective when they work together to achieve effective land protection on larger landscapes. Next slide. Just to give you a few examples of the work that we're doing here specifically at Alpine, we began to develop a series of briefs that highlighted schools in New England and and the air, actually beyond New England a bit that had conserved lands. These briefs talk about various aspects and strategies that schools use to conserve land. These can be used to motivate other schools to explore conserving their own lands. Next slide. So Connecticut College is an example of one of these that has integrated its land into an arboretum and natural area that encompasses 750 acres and that include natural areas and other managed landscapes. Key to the college's acquisition and conservation of these properties were two key faculty members. One, Richard Goodwin was one of the founders of the Nature Conservancy, so really deeply uh, passionate about land conservation and, and the campus benefited from that. So at this point now, the campus and the Arboretum of Connecticut College is not only an academic center, but also an important part of land conservation and stewardship for the area. The mission of the Arboretum includes teaching, research, conservation, recreation, stewardship of natural resources, and public education. And at this point today, the Arboretum is of key importance to the identity of the college and its educational mission. Next slide. Another example, and this is outside of New England, is Kenyon College. Uh, it's an example of a college that didn't, doesn't own a lot of its own land, but it's been involved in getting land surrounding the college conserved. 
Kenyon is only the only college or university in the country to establish its own land trust. In the mid 1980s, the area immediately surrounding the college was under threat by commercial and residential growth. In response, the college purchased property from uh, across from the entrance of the college and established a nature preserve along the river there. The college formed the Philanderer Chase Conservancy in 2000 in anticipation of a greater need to protect the farmland and rural nature of the surrounding area. The mission of the Philander Chase Conservancy is to protect the natural beauty of the farms, woodlands, waters, and open spaces surrounding Kenyon College and to preserve the rural character of the region at large. Next slide, please. And then I'll give you um, some examples of these regional conservation collaborations that Alpine is involved with. One of them is the Engage with the Connecticut River Pioneer Valley Project. And this is a collaboration that involves a group of organizations in the Friends of the Conti Wildlife Refuge. Uh, the partners include the Nature Conservancy, the uh, Appalachian Mountain Club, the Kestrel Land Trust, which is a local land trust, that are leading a sub-regional conservation effort centered on the Connecticut River watershed. This initiative is focused on advancing land conservation in the region with an emphasis on climate, biodiversity, land justice, and providing access to underserved communities. The work will focus on the diversity of farms, forests, and communities in this region and seek to leverage many types of funding. Alpine will engage the large number of colleges and universities in the watershed, which include Hampshire College, Amherst College, University of Massachusetts, Westfield State University, Holyoke Community Colleges, and many other others in the Connecticut River watershed. The other example of a regional partnership is uh, the Northern Appalachian Trail Landscape Partnership, which is a group of collaborators that operate along the northern part of the Appalachian Trail, which covers a 10 million acre landscape from eastern New York to northern Maine. The, this partnership is working on prioritizing conservation projects to protect scenery along the trail, the water quality, the forests, other natural resources, and enhance biodiversity while engaging many more communities in the corridor's use and stewardship. Alpine is involved as a partner with 11 of these regional conservation partnerships, the Trust for Public Lands, the Nature Conservancy, Audubon, and the Open Space Institute, and other governmental agencies that operate along the Appalachian Trail. Alpine engages students and faculty from the various colleges and universities to work with this partnership to build the network with expertise, strategies, and activities, and forge connections and collaborations with other entities. Next slide, please. So just to show you another example, uh, and not just have Alpine be the one example, of an institution that is incorporating climate change and biodiversity goals into their own program is the College of William and Mary in Virginia. In 2020, the college launched the Institute for Integrative Conservation with a $19 million alumni gift. They set up this institute as a cross-disciplinary entity to position the university as a global leader in transformational research to protect ecosystems and safeguard world populations. It will cultivate leaders prepared to drive policy, advance advocacy, and inspire action at the local, national, and international levels. In its innovative programming, academia combines forces, their, their institution combines forces with the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to advance solutions to the world's most pressing conservation and sustainability challenges. The Institute supports multidisciplinary teams of faculty, staff, and students to address conservation issues in a multitude of ways. Teams drawn from all of William and Mary's five schools will collaborate on research projects and convene international conversations with leading experts at universities, federal government, nonprofit organizations, and private companies. As the president says, Quotes, the reason for the word integrative is that they want to take a different approach to conservation. Traditionally, it's been centered in the sciences. They want to take a much broader view of conservation and build in business processes, strategic leadership, and the rights of indigenous peoples, as many conservation problems stemming from the conflict involve economic development in developing nations. And they'll do this by, again, establishing internship opportunities, an international scholarship program 
to prepare students or careers into this profession. They'll hire internationally renowned experts and utilize the talents and expertise of current faculty members that they have to establish a new multidisciplinary educational model integrative conservation. They're also going to develop a major in that. And then grow and sustain uh, collaborations between conservation organizations and researchers to inject new ideas and solutions into the conservation practices while guiding university-based researchers towards pragmatic solutions. These partnerships will enable the university to train new conservation practitioners. As I said. Back to you, David. Thanks very much, Marianne. So let me just close with, with two thoughts. The first one, a brief one that just leaves the regional scale of New England and just presents these two images, one of Boston on the right and one of, one of New England on the left with academic institutions in both to let us ponder what the impact would be if all the schools in Boston worked not just fervently on their own lands, but to come together to support the kinds of vision that the leadership in Boston have, and that could be accentuated by leadership from the colleges and universities to really make this the most livable place and the most supportive place for both the academic institutions and all residents. And of course, all of that could be done at a regional scale as well, with each working you know, in, in this scheme that has been laid out by Second Nature for climate change at a local level on campus, around their community, and all the way up to the globe. But I'd like to to end with actually the perspective of an entire institution and that of a sustainability program or sustainability institute. And that's with the thoughts of our colleague, Tom Kelly, who's the executive director of the Sustainability Institute at the University of New Hampshire. Now, Tom is joined with Marianne and me and with others in developing this talk and thinking about these issues. And he would have joined us if another conflict hadn't kept him away today. But Tom's program at UNH developed significantly under administrations at the university that strongly believed that advancing conservation and the sustainable land stewardship needs of the community and the region should be a central mission of higher education. The Sustainability Institute itself began with, and from here on out, I'll largely use Tom's words, what he calls a cultural and institutional transformation to make the University of New Hampshire a driver and a partner of sustainability through everything it does. Again, in Tom's words, the Institute is grounded in the principles and the commitments of sustainability. And it seeks to deal with sustainability in its full complexity and in all of its disruptive implications to the way that higher education and many other institutions have worked in the past. Now you can see from this diagram that the effort at the University of New Hampshire engages all facets of the university from operations to education and curriculum and on to research and engagement on campus and well beyond it. And then you can also see as highlighted in the red circles here that in following the approach that's advocated by the 2021 report that I mentioned at the outset of this talk, the effort at the university addresses all the domains that we've mentioned, and it does so simultaneously. Looking at climate, at biodiversity, at food systems, and at 
human environment, human well-being, and culture. UNH's work through the Sustainability Institute includes building collaborative networks in the state and in the region, not just to study the world, but to engage it and to change it for the better. One prime example is Food Solutions New England, part of the Sustainability Institute, but reaching much farther beyond it to, for, to join with many other collaborators, which seeks to advance regional food system sustainability that's grounded in the shared values of sustainable farming and fishing, racial equity, trust, democratic empowerment, and dignity for all. To step up to this challenge, the Sustainability Institute and Food Solutions New England have recently joined with the Harvard Forest and Wildlands and Woodlands and the Highstead Foundation to create a regional policy program to advance this shared work while weaving ever stronger ties that connect our networks and other networks across food systems, including fisheries, forests and land conservation, and racial equity in food, land, and sea justice. The pace and the depth of the change that is really required to begin and to do what we have talked about today will require a, a true transformation in the way that colleges and universities operate and how they operate both internally and externally. As Tom put it earlier, the university has to not just study the world, but to engage in it and engage in it for positive change. But as he's also said, to do that in fact is a form of study and experimentation in social change, which is what universities are all about. So to conclude, I think to have an impact in our communities, across our regions, and certainly beyond that, will require the work of all of us who are engaged in any way at all in the academic environment. So with that, Marion and I wanna thank you. We're very delighted to take questions. And then down below, we've shared our contact information as we are very much interested in hearing questions, hearing suggestions, finding people to discuss these issues with and collaborate. And we've also put down two of our websites, which will get people connected to all of what we've talked about today. So with that, I'd like to conclude and would welcome any questions. Thank you so much, David, and thank you, Marianne. Um, again, my name is Chantal, and I'll be helping to facilitate our discussion today. Thank you to everyone who has submitted questions in the chat. I'll also be leading on my colleague, Mia Sen, um, Second Nature's Climate Programs Associate, to assist us in the Q&A today. So I'll just uh, kick us off with our first question in the Q&A. Um, this is from Justin Heavey, and the question reads, um, is there any data on the, quote, influence of higher education on society at large in addressing climate change? I think we often anecdotally put ourselves on a pedestal in higher education and boast about our influence on society, but the actual impact on the real world is nebulous. Yeah, I think, I think that's a, a great question. Um, I guess my approach to it would be to look to those people who have been actively promoting that, to look to groups like Second Nature who are working actively in that area for a sense of what has been accomplished. Um, I think it's, it's undeniable that there is a tremendous role that academia has played starting with the basic science and understanding of climate change and the ways to address it, and then moving on beyond that. Um, but I guess I would reframe it and, and state that whatever we have done, 
it has certainly not been enough and that what we have done is going to be misguided if it isn't expanded to include these other spheres. And so my question is what more can we do and how can we move from a, a kind of a podium and exhortation mode into a more effective action mode? Thank you. Um, our second question is, while there are some, this is from Matt Polsky, while there are some new things presented here, I think we have to really rethink academia's role. For example, thinking. How can we really think differently about protecting biodiversity above and beyond traditional measures? Two, clarifying. I was at a webinar last week that said thinning is a myth as far as fire prevention. Implicitly, the anthropogenic premise um, of the need of, for active human management of forests is wrong. And basically, there's no such thing as sustainable biomass, leaving me very confused. Three, non-academic slash academic work. I hear from numerous sources that people don't respond to information. So the question is, how do academics add their game? Hmm. Yeah. Well, uh, there's very little that um, was stated in that that um, I wouldn't agree with, uh, in the sense that um, it is very easy to find contradictory information. Oftentimes, that's because information is being applied from one area or one region, or in the case that was cited here, from one forest to another, um, or it's being applied with a series of objectives that differed among the people who were responding to the question and uh, the kind of charge being presented. Um, I also think that there are there's new information that is leading us to act in, in new ways. But I think the larger issue that, that was raised by the question uh, is really that this is a very complex enterprise. And I think that all the people who are involved in trying to encourage colleges and universities, academia broadly, to become involved in addressing crises and challenges that are facing communities to the globe, recognize that we do need new modes of operation, new modes of thinking, new modes of, of, um, of teaching our students and engaging them in real world situations that move out of classrooms and into practice and we need new modes of kind of promoting and rewarding the people who work at universities for what they accomplish. And so these, these challenges, this need to move out of the ivory tower, if you will, into the real world requires a, a new, new suite of behaviors, but it will also need us to grapple with the fact that there are not only differences in information sources, but differences in opinions and in values. Ryan, yeah, I would just want to add to that. Yeah, I was just going to add to that, that definitely it need, there needs to be a reward system for that kind of uh, practical application of, of research and not just a reward for, you know, keep publishing journals to, you know, and, and not worry about who's using it. But I think this is why we're talking about these real world collaborations is that, I mean, I could see at the end of um, Matt's response, you know, that people don't respond to the information. Well, I think it's the onus of that is on us in academia to understand what, what they need. And I, we do hear that from a lot of organizations like we can't translate this information to anything that's useful. And I think that that we need to we need to do. Um, as, as academic institutions, we have to really reward that 
process of, uh, of making it useful and translatable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you both for sharing your thoughts on that. Um, our next question comes in from Jennifer Dillon, who asks, do you see a space for non-college academic institutions, for example, independent schools that have a great deal of land into the Alpine Initiative? Uh, yeah, great, great question. Go ahead, Marianne. Yeah, sorry, David. Um, great question. That's been on our minds as well. They're particularly private, you know, um, high schools throughout New England, as you know, that that actually own quite a bit of land. So we have been interested in getting them involved. They there are there is interest by them to get involved in in what, for instance, the network of Alpine, uh, but in in also just engaging in in land conservation. So we haven't done it yet, but it's on our list to do. Yeah, the, the thing I would add is that we have so many different types of of educational enterprises that that can be involved, and some of them are traditionally more application oriented, and we have we have an awful lot to be learned from those. And so it it isn't just private institutions; it's public institutions. It's a a wide array array of of educational institutions that, that can be involved. And even though we may have seemed to kind of emphasize more the academic participants or the academic and administrative participants, it's the day-to-day -day work of everybody in these institutions that is going to make the difference. And it's going to be the integration across the institution, which is going to require leadership, but it's also going to require buy-in by all of the participants. And so as everybody who comes from a sustainability background knows or works within a sustainability initiative within a college or university knows, integration across these institutions is just a phenomenally different, difficult challenge. And respect across the different parts of the university are very is very challenging to achieve. Thank you, David. These next two questions um, are kind of related. So I'll read both of them to you and perhaps we could address um, both of them. Um, these questions are from Caitlin Jacobs and Kate Nelson. Um, the first question reads, I work at a private university in the Midwest. Do you have any recommendations for those of us not in the Northeast, but um, would, who would like to see similar regional conservation programs done in the future? So this um, out of the north, outside of the Northeast question, and then the second question by Kate is: What kinds of partnerships? What kinds of partnerships exist to aid academ academia in managing these lands? Um, so partnerships, and then regional conservation programs that exist perhaps outside of the Northeast. You want to take that, David, first? Well, I can begin just by saying that, um, yeah, I think that there are, are bright examples scattered throughout, throughout the United States. Uh, I think what is ultimately needed, and this is why we are so happy to, to be talking, um, you know, to, uh, to a group that's brought together by Second Nature and why we've been interested in talking also with Aishi is that there is a need to share information at a greater scale at a greater scale. And there's absolutely no reason that great lessons that are being produced by the Kenyan colleges of the world or West Coast colleges can't be shared north and south and, and east. And that certainly is not something that that we are striving to do ourselves, but something that we seek to develop to help us all. Yeah, I would just add to Caitlin's question, and it's a great one. Um, there are organizations, there's a network of large landscape uh, conservation groups that we can be, we can uh, we can help you be in touch with. Also, this this model of these regional conservation partnerships that we've been talking about in New England, they are expanding. So there's one now in uh, the Chesapeake Bay area. And so they've been interested and been learning from the model up here, applying it to what they're doing down there. So I think with a group of partners 
that definitely is doable and we hope you know will happen in the rest of the country so if you yeah I'll, i'm going to take your information down and we'll be in touch yeah that'll be great sounds great so it looks like we have four minutes left and time or three minutes left now and we have time for about i think the two more questions that we have left in this in the Q&A box, so I'll go ahead and get to those. Um, next, we have a question from Steph Fergosi that asks, how can the schools in the greater Boston area work to ensure that their conservation efforts both increase conserve land and are also mindful of the potential for gentrification in the area? Really important question to ask. I mean, one of the things, there isn't just a group of Boston uh, academic institutions working towards Boston, but there are good examples. For instance, Boston University is working very closely with the city um, to tackle, you know, climate issues like sea, sea level rise and things like that. University of Massachusetts as well. Um, but there isn't a sort of, we talk about that having a a, a, car, a conservation partnership of groups within the urban area of Boston, because it is really important. And it does, it will be important to maintain green space, to have equitable, you know, and be that be equitable and, and not gentrify everywhere and have it be too expensive for anybody to live here. Also, we, we think it's very important for, to provide people from Boston who don't have the ability to get out to the Appalachian Trail and other parts of the of the state to be able to have access for that and really working to see how can we do that, you know, in terms of providing transportation, making it easier to be able to get to these places, because that's a huge issue as well. Yeah, I would just say be in touch. We would love to talk because yeah. uh, there are some efforts moving in that direction, but they're really fledgling. Really important. All right, um, and our last and final question comes from Piper Wood. Um, it says, considering that all of this land um, that private institutions occupy is stolen land, what measures are being taken to continually honor the land for cultural as well as biological diversity, particularly for indi um, indigenous populations in the region? Yeah, I would say that uh, the the efforts within, broadly within the academic community are very incomplete and very mixed. There is growing interest and engagement and energy putting in this exact direction, of course, with many conservation organizations. I would also just point out that actually on Thursday, if you go on the website for wildlands and woodlands, and look at under regional conservation partnerships and events, the annual gathering of many of the, well, of the regional conservation partnerships and many hundreds of organizations in New England is taking place on Thursday. And the theme of that meeting is land justice. And so this issue will be absolutely this and associated issues will be absolutely central to that. Yeah, I was just gonna to try to put it in the chat so it's easier to see. Let me see if I can do that. Um, but while the only thing I would add is super important question. Yes, it's very important for colleges and universities to acknowledge that and understand it and know what to do about it. The thing that I would critically wanna see is that we don't tell them what you know, the answer to that, that we engage with indigenous groups and organizations and understand and hear from them as to what they, you know, what they want, what is the solution and that they're part of that conversation and that we just don't do a top down thing. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I'll give Marianne a chance to add that in the chat. And in the meantime, I just wanted to take a moment to thank our speakers. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, David for being here and, and talking to us about how colleges and, and universities can engage in both land protection and biodiversity. Um, it was great having you today. And I also wanna extend a, extend a very special thank you to Mia Sen from Second Nature, who's been in the background helping us with tech support today. So thank you, Mia. Um, again, um, contact information's on the screen if you'd like to follow up with both David and Marianne. Um, otherwise, Thank you all for joining us today and I hope to see you next time.
Thanks well, thank so much. Thank you very and, much. Chantal, and thanks everybody for joining.